Welcome to Women Making a Difference, PJSAO Women Who Inspire and Motivate. Ashley Ward, thank you so much for joining me today. No problem. I'm so excited. So, Ashley, you are one of our youngest attorneys in the (laughs) office, but you're doing great work. And, you know, so many times, you know, our community members know who I am because I am the elected state's attorney, and so they hear from me a lot. But you know what? You have a significant role in this office, too, and you work really hard on their behalf every single day. So why don't you tell our viewers about your role in the office? So currently, I am a district court prosecutor in the Special Victims Family Violence Unit. So I deal with your domestic violence cases. Sometimes I see your family violence cases. And then on occasion, I work with regular district court to prosecute the crimes against property and crimes against persons that aren't necessarily related to domestic or family. It could be your neighbor or a stranger, or we'll do the jailable traffic, which is your DUIs, your suspended license on occasion. So just so we can stay well-rounded. Absolutely. So, you know, coming out of high school, uh, not high school, but law school, <laughs> you look like you just came out of high school, but, but you did come out of law school. So coming out of law school, um, you know, did you think you would be doing this work? Did you always want to be a prosecutor? If not, like who or what inspired you to like do this work? Um, I have always wanted to be a prosecutor. I can remember like being really young and talking to my parents and I was like listening to the news. My, the news stays on in my house all the time. And my dad and mom are always talking about, you know, crimes and politics. And so I knew I was always going to be a prosecutor because my dad has always established that dialogue with me. Like, if this was you, what would you do? Hmm. I grew up kind of telling my dad, like, oh, I was, I'm going to be a prosecutor. I've never thought any different. And then in law school, Um, Though we take our general courses, we were allowed to veer off a little bit and I started working as a garden at Lytham working with um, children and that were in situations with parents where maybe they couldn't keep them due to drugs or violence or anything within the household. And so I would go interview them and just working with children and maybe moms that weren't in the best situations and hearing their stories. I was like, oh, I want to do domestic violence. And then I was a mentor at Faith, Hope, and Love uh, Mm -hmm. in North Carolina, where I worked with um, children. And I would just go there after school to help them with homework. And there was one girl in particular that I worked with. And just hearing her story even pushed me even more, like, I want to do this. But even outside of being a mentor in law school, just dealing with young women and seeing how we interact with men in our relationships or how men interact with us. I wanted to just be a part of that because for the younger generation, I think that there's this dialogue that an unhealthy relationship is the kind of relationship you want because you see it so much. So I just wanted to be a part of breaking that narrative. Like that's not normal. So yeah. So how have those experience experiences informed the work that you're doing now? Um, I think that they have made me a lot more patient and a lot more understanding. I think what happens a lot of times with victims, when they come into our office, they feel like we don't understand them. And they don't a lot of times want, you know, you to be sympathetic with them. They want that understanding. They want to know that you relate to them. So being around children that have been in a home of domestic violence or friends that have necessarily been in domestic violence relationships or even like personally dealing with my own personal relationships in the past, I can relate to them and it makes them a little bit more comfortable and a little bit more willing to talk to you because they don't feel like they're talking to this judgmental person and they're just another case, another victim. And a lot of times they don't even see themselves as victims. So the moment you throw out that word, they're just like, stop, I'm not a victim. And and I don't want you to call me a victim. So then you already get that tense relationship with right. them. So I really think it just helps me break that barrier with them immediately to make them comfortable. And we just, you know, we can go back and forth and have a conversation and it doesn't feel like an interview all the time. So. So I, I know because, you know, obviously I, I know the great work you're doing in our office, but I also know the challenges of dealing uh, with uh, people who are victims who either don't want to admit that they're victims or feel scared to move forward with their cases. And so oftentimes these cases either um, 
you know, end up not being able to be prosecuted because we don't have a cooperating uh, victim witness, um, or for whatever reason, we cannot move forward with those cases. Um, how does that make you feel uh, when we're unable to move forward for one reason or another? So disappointed. I, I feel like the one of the hardships of this job of being not even of doing um, just prosecution as a whole, because certain parts of prosecution you may not take home. With domestic violence, I feel like it weighs on your spirit a lot of time mm -hmm. because you start developing relationships with the people that you deal with. Like some of my victims I've known since I started. And so when we get to their cases, I'm really, really invested, like very, very invested. Or those victims that I haven't known for a short amount of time, but I know something's going on and I want to help, but you just don't trust anybody. And so you don't show for court. And I, I, I've called family members to get in contact with victims, like, please have them in court, like, I have their back, I'm here, like, I believe them, and so when they still don't show, I'm just like, you know, I, I always say a prayer, because I don't know why you didn't show, I don't know that if, you know, you're okay, and you didn't get justice this way, but I, at least, hopefully, I don't know what they believe in, but for me, you know, I just ask God to protect you, because I, I couldn't do that, so... It's, it's, it's so difficult and I try not to let it weigh on, you know, when I, I try to leave work at work, but this working in this unit with this kind of topic, it's just really hard not to take it home all the time. And I've had victims afterwards text me and say, you know, I'm sorry, I didn't show, I just couldn't do it. And, right. you know, I understand, I always tell them I, I do understand. And if they, you know, need anything, know they can always call 911, know, you know, you have the commissioners. And, you know, as long as I'm in the office, I hope I don't see you again for any other reason. But if I do, you know, know I'm here, you have my cell phone number and you can always reach out. Actually, that's so important because oftentimes, as we know, it takes victims seven times to actually leave their abuser. So, you know, you may be, you know, the third or fourth act okay. of abuse. You, you may be catching them on that. And so it is, it can be frustrating, but we know that, um, you know, our worst day uh, is not worse than theirs. Right. And I think that's, um, that's something that we uh, carry with us as, as prosecutors, whether it's dealing with, you know, um, sex crimes or uh, intimate partner violence, or if it's dealing with homicides or motor vehicle cases. Right. I mean, we understand that even though we're frustrated and we, we go through a lot um, and it is a stressful, busy office, uh, we know that the stress it, it, that we're dealing with uh, nowhere compares oftentimes right. to the stress that the, our victims are dealing with. And so, um, yeah, so, so it is, it, I, I, I understand how taxing it is, um, especially in a unit like yours, especially uh, because you care, right. uh, but that what that's what's what makes you an excellent uh, prosecutor. That's what's going to continue to drive your career. It is that passion, because um, even though we try to leave things in the office, we are all human, <laughs> right. you know. And I think people want to know that there's a human uh, prosecuting their case. If you're a defendant, you certainly want a human being. Right. <laughs> With compassion, but also for our victims, I think they also want to know that we identify with them and that we're standing up for them and we are their voice oftentimes right. in the courtroom. And sometimes we can actually move forward if we have enough evidence, even right. without the victim. That right. doesn't always happen. We don't always have that opportunity, but sometimes we do. Um, and, and it is our job to pursue justice and we do, and we do, do that. Right. So I know that there are other um, options if, if a victim does not want to move forward but still needs services we do work with them on housing and other things you want to talk right. about what else we provide so we work a lot with the family justice center um, and for victims usually my conversations with them are pretty much the same when I initially meet them you know I introduce myself I tell them why I'm calling and then once they get comfortable and we kind of I kind of gauge where they're at Sometimes if I get a victim who's like, I don't want to go forward, he didn't do anything, I'll tell them, okay, well, is there anything that you need? Because I, I can, we can get counseling or, you know, we can get you housing. Do we need to get you moved? I had a victim come in the other day and she needed immediate removal from her home. 
um, because her abuser found out her location. And I contacted somebody from the Family Justice Center immediately. I had a victim witness coordinator come over immediately. They sat with her until we could figure out how to get her, you know, moved from that situation. Um, children, I, I'll always ask your kids need counseling. If they were present during a, an assault or they've been present in the home during, you know, just the whole relationship where it hasn't been good, do they need counseling? Um, I usually, we have a pamphlet if you come into our office for the Family Justice Center. I always tell them when they come see me, go immediately over there and talk to Ms. Smith because she can get you whatever you need. I, I think maybe a few months ago last year, we had a case, I, I specifically handled a case with due to, due to the assault, they had both been kicked out of their apartment complex. This woman had lost her job and everything. And maybe around Christmas time, I got a random call and I picked it up and it was her and I had sent her over to the Family Justice Center and she ended up not only finding a new home, we were able to get her um, a job. She was able to, they did a thing for Christmas where they had gifts over at the Family Justice Center and she was able to have gifts for her children and stuff like that. And I think for her, it wasn't her case got dismissed, but it was more than that. It wasn't about him being prosecuted. For her, it was, I was in such a bad situation at my lowest point and you guys helped me get back to normal. And she was like, I'm just grateful for that. And so she was able to get out of that relationship. So our family, I send them legit. Once you see me, I'm going to send you right over there. I'm like, our conversation is done. I got all my notes. I need you to go over there. I've already called them. They're the purple sidewalk. Just walk straight in and somebody will help you. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Ashley, you know, you really are changing and saving lives in the work that you do. So that has to feel really <laughs> good for you. So it, make, it balances those tough days, right? Yeah. When you have these successes. Um, tell us about one of your most challenging cases. Oh, man. My most challenging case wasn't even a domestic violence case. It was, it was... It was my first criminal docket um, that I had first chaired and I had a senior attorney sitting with me. And this, the case was a trespass case and the, the officer and the senior attorney were talking about how I should handle the case. And I ran into this issue of him being homeless, mm. like mental health issues. And it bothered me, it, oh, it bothered me. So it still bothers me to this day. Um, he ended up taking a plea. Uh, we had to talk to the judge about the plea because I was telling her I didn't feel comfortable pleading him because I knew he was homeless and I knew he had mental health issues. And so she was like trying to walk me through what a good plea looks like. And I'm very thankful for a lot of our judges because they're like teachers. This is why we do what we do. You know, you got to get him help. And if he doesn't want to do it voluntarily, we're, you know, we just might have to force him to get help and it'll, it will make him better. And I was addressing my concerns about him violating and I was telling, I know he's going to violate probation. And I'm, I don't ever want anybody to feel like I set them up to fail because that's not what I, what I do. And so as we're, he accepted the plea, we worked something out where he was going to get treatment and um, we get through the plea and I don't think most people know we have to read the statement of charges if this matter had proceeded to trial what we would have proven. And I just remember I almost wanted to cry because the statement of charges were so they were so bad because they were talking about you know how dirty his clothes were and like maybe his smell and I was just in court like just get through it Ashley just get through it and I ended up getting through it and I had my head down. Like I was looking down the rest of the uh, time and the defendant, he ended up getting the last word. And uh, he was like, I'm, I'm pleading guilty because I'm guilty. But he was like, you know, you know, your honor, I don't have anywhere to go. You know, my family doesn't want anything to do with me because I'm, I'm homeless. My uncle lets me pick my mail up at his house. And, you know, I just, I, I don't remember anybody being there. It was in a decent exposure. And he's like, I don't even remember seeing anybody. But he was like, but it's probably because I wasn't on my medication and I just was out of it. Um, but he's like, you know, Madam State was reading, you know, that my clothes were dirty. And he's like, my clothes were dirty because I'm homeless. And, you know, I, I smelled the way I did because, you know, I, I don't have anywhere to go. And it just 
broke my heart. And I um, remember us, we got through the case and it was my last case. And I remember calling my mom and just telling her how bad I felt. And a month, I think a month later, and he ended up violating his probation. I remember being in court. I got assigned, we get randomly assigned Bob dockets. Yeah. And so I was just with that judge that day and I was looking at the cases. As I walked in the court, I asked the court from clerk for the docket and I saw his name on the docket and I just remember my heart dropping in my stomach. And I just felt like I felt like I had set this man up and he came in and he, you know, he wasn't shaved and, you know, I knew he was back on the street and, and I remember telling the judge, asking her to approach and telling her, I wish I hadn't done the plea. And she was like, you know, she was trying to make me feel better. And she was like, well, now we're going to have him admitted into treatment. And she was like, sir, I'm not going to give you any backup jail time. We're going to have you admitted into treatment. And he was thankful for that, but it still, it still like haunts me. And I just, I don't know. Well, well, Ashley, let, let me make you feel a little bit better because, no, 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 seriously, because it is stories like that one um, that has driven, you know, me to, to want to create a homeless diversion program. And we're in the process. We're very close to finalizing the details of that program. Uh, but what I'd like uh, to do is have you uh, be a part of creating that program. Um, we are, we're in the final stages, but then we actually have to implement it. And okay. I think you would be a wonderful person to help us uh, with that implementation. Um, so I'm gonna connect you. <laughs> 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 um, and, and no, but, but because we don't want you to have to make those decisions. You know, you know it, it is, it's, um, it's difficult choices because on the one hand you have residents who right. are calling who are saying, look, I don't want this person, you know, trespassing on our property. And right. they have a right not to have someone trespassing on their property. Right. But we also know that we have people in our communities who have, you know, illnesses, whether it's mental health, drug addiction, uh, alcohol addiction, or just other other issues, right? right? That drive, no one grows up saying, I want to be homeless. We understand right. that. Um, so I think that we have to find a balance. Right. And I think that balance is if that person does come into contact with the criminal justice system, instead of fur further criminalizing them, you know, is there a way for us to divert them so that right. they get the help they need um, without putting them further in the justice system. And right. so uh, I, I recognize that that's an issue. And that's why we're working hard to implement this new program. It is for trespassing and for the fourth degree burglaries, which is breaking okay. into an, an unoccupied space. It's for right. those types of quality of life crimes that are that may seem minor to some people, but for the victim, whether it's a business or a, a resident or community, right. um, it, it's meaningful. It's meaningful. Right. And so we have to address both issues, right? And that's right. what we're going to do. So Ashley, you'll be a part of the solution. Okay. Well, thank you. <laughs> And I just want to um, just shift a little bit, because I know that we don't have that much time left, shift a little right. bit to just a national kind of political and, 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 and discussions around um, our, the justice system. Right. You know, um, post George, George Floyd, post Breonna Taylor, and so many other cases that we hear about nationally, we locally have to face the reality that our community is demanding something different from us. Right. So I would like to know from your perspective, being that you are a millennial, which is, you know, uh, unfortunately, you all make up a significant portion of our dockets, right? right. <laughs> so, but, but you are a millennial. Um, what challenges and then also what opportunities do you see uh, for our office and, and prosecution generally? I the challenges and the opportunities, I think they kind of run into each other for our office because unlike other offices, a lot of times, um, I think one of the challenges are we all look alike sometimes. So I look like the defendant, our judges may look like the defendant, you know, our courtroom clerks, everybody. And, you know, when I say that as African-Americans, we sometimes are all in the courtroom and everybody looks alike. So it's a challenge sometimes as a prosecutor, as a black 
woman when you have somebody on the other side of the table that looks like you? Because I get a lot of times like, um, you like to throw your people in jail. That's what you do. And so it's so frustrating to me because I'm like, that's not what I do. Um, mm -hmm. And the judges, it's the same thing. Oh, you, you know, you, you threw another black person in jail and that's not what we're doing. And so I think it creates, you know, a lot of times they're like, oh, you, you know, you're a part of the problem with the police and, you know, stuff like that. So that's such a big challenge to get, get people to see. And so one of my best friends is a public defender and we always have the, you know, this rhetoric back and forth about, about that. But I tell her the beautiful thing about where I work is we all look alike. And so this negative connotation that you've associated with, you know, black, black prosecutors or black officers or a black judge, we are there to stop that feeling. You know, we're not there for injustice, you know, and that, and I always make sure that I review my cases thoroughly, thoroughly. So nobody ever feel, walks out of that courtroom and feels like justice wasn't served. Because I remember being a law clerk and hearing people talk about when they did the jury, were you satisfied with the way the state handled your case? And a lot of people would say no. And I never understood why until I became a prosecutor. Mm -hmm. It was like, I get it. I get you guys get frustrated with the way the police handle it. And then when you get to us, you feel like we're part of the problem. And so I always want to make people know, like, I'm, I'm not here to set you up. I, I'm here to get the best result. And the best result sometimes isn't jail time. And sometimes jail time is, you know, the only thing that I can do at that moment. And so, you know, I, you know, I just wish people, more people could come to our county and just see what we do. Uh, I brought my best friend a few weeks ago and she left in awe. And she was just like, what I thought isn't what, what it's like here. And I was like, it's, it's not. So I know that we na nationally and locally, we, we have these horrible things going on, but I just wish people knew it's not like that everywhere. And everybody that does our job, you know, the, the, the people that have done horrible things don't represent the majority of us. Absolutely. So to step outside of that to see it. Absolutely. And, you know, uh, Ashley, you being the future of our office is just, you know, knowing that we're training a, a group of young, conscientious, uh, smart, but compassionate, um, you know, lawyers and litigators, um, you know, it, that makes me feel good. Uh, because I know that uh, that you understand, you know, you have your own set of values, right, that right. you grew up with, but that you also see those values in our office, right. and that's that's so critical. So I'm so excited, and I'm so happy that everyone got to meet you today, and I also am excited to know a little bit more about things that, you know, that you're passionate about, and also how to include you a little bit more in right some of the reforms that we're making in the office. So thank you so much for the work you do every day. You're and, welcome. Um, yes, and continued success here in the office. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brave Boy. I really appreciate you for having me. Thank you.